live. Gabe, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So uh, I got connected with you from our good buddy, Ollie Richard. So shout out to Ollie. We love him. I'm into that. We do love him. <laughs> Ollie's the man. One of my favorite guests so far. And uh, hopefully you'll be right up there, if not better. I, I will. I will. If I can get to number two under Ollie, I will be very, very happy with that. Ollie's a great guy. <laughs> Ollie's amazing. I love him. So, so I have to tell you, um, and we'll get into this, but I, um, oh, well, first, uh, introduce yourself, uh, tell people that don't know who you are, who you are, and then we'll go from there. Then I have something so, to tell you. Well, all right. Uh, well, <laughs> waiting, waiting with bated breath. Uh, but I'm, I'm Gabe, <laughs> Gabe Weiner. Um, I run, I, I wrote a book called Fluent Forever that came out in 2014. And then went on a crazy startup adventure of just like, what, what goes along with this book? Let's try this. Let's go along with this book. Let's try that. And so at this point, running a big old startup of like, God, I think we're like 50 people at this point, just Jeez. doing language learning stuff. It's been everything for, I mean, really since 2014, but really since like kind of 2010, it's been my focus. Yeah. So that. That's awesome. How many members do you guys have roughly? Um, in terms of like subscribers, stuff like that. Yeah. On the Fluent um, Forever app. That is around 22,000 at this point. Pretty awesome. It's been, it's been a ride. <laughs> <laughs> do you, do you love it? Um, I love parts of it. There's, there's aspects of the job where, uh, what parts do you like, hate? I mean, running around trying to fundraise is brutal. Uh, mm. just, just going to people like the, like I've probably pitched this thing like 500 times and gotten a good Jeez. like 450 rejections. And so <laughs> there's, there's this, a level of just like, how many times do you want to get punched in the face kind of thing that is a part of, of this job that is just stays hard. Um, there's a lot of like hard choices of like, you know, do we need to let people go even when they're good people because of X, Y, Z, like mm -hmm. that's, that's brutal. It doesn't get easier. Um, right. you get, you get better at it, but it doesn't get easier. Um, so like those pieces are rough dealing with just like, man, how much money do we have in the bank? Can we handle this? Can we not like that stuff's right. rough, but, but like the moments where you can get in front of a group of people and like open their eyes to stuff about learning, it just, just reveal that like, Hey, this is possible. Did you not know that? Cause like, it's totally possible. Let me show you this thing. Um, it doesn't get more rewarding than that. I mean, that's special and, and we've. So it's been kind of like a stage for that. There's been opportunities where I can get in front of just not one-on-one, -on -one, like groups and just be like, Hey, <laughs> check this shit out. Right. Uh, and that, that's just energizing that, that I could do that all day. That's awesome. So Fool and Forever is, is a book. I actually have the book. Um, I bought it a year ago. So surprise. Um, uh -huh. and so I have, I, I have Fool and Forever. So there's Fool and Forever. There's, uh, you know, Ollie Richards, uh, story learning. There's Benny Lewis, Fool in three months. Obviously you have like the Rosetta stones, but I feel like in the language learning community, nobody, nobody respects, uh, Rosetta stone, um, except for their marketing. They have great marketing and they great do. colors they too. Do. Their colors stand out. Those kiosks in the mall, you definitely know it's a Rosetta stone kiosk. <laughs> you do. I mean, they, they just got bought like twice in the last like year. Uh, and the newest owner, I, I've had a bunch of conversations with them recently. Like, I like that guy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I'm, I'm excited about what they might be able to do coming, coming forward. Like they, that they're, right. they're now run by, by, by a guy who really has been, has been aiming to like reform Rosetta for, for like 25 years. Like that's good. That's yeah. good. So. And then Duolingo, Duolingo was the first. So I did actually buy Rosetta Stone like 10 years ago. Uh, I bought Mandarin, Chinese and Spanish. Um, I think I, I bought all five, like level one through five. And then the next one was Duolingo, uh, thanks to Tim Ferriss. And so I used Duolingo and I was like, yeah, that's okay. I used it for a couple of years, but you know, we'll get into like, you know, what actually works and what doesn't work. Sure. Um, but then I stumbled across you as like one of the first uh, pioneers of language learning. And ironically, we got, we met from Ali, right? Yeah. So I didn't even reach out to you. You didn't reach out to me. Ali connected us and didn't know anything. He just said, Hey, I think that uh, Gabe would be a great uh, guest. But ironically, this is what I wanted to tell you is you were the first one that I um, 
discovered as like a person besides like a company Rosetta Stone or whatever that yeah. I looked into how a learning languages and the, you know the systematic process on how to be the most effective. That was because I saw you, that you were in Tim Ferriss's blog. So got it. So uh, that was like I think two years ago. Maybe yeah, maybe two, yeah. I would say two years ago, and it was. I saw him actually, he was on a podcast. It was like the random show and I was watching yeah. it on YouTube and somebody brought up language learning and he brought up fluent forever and Gabe Weiner and stuff. So I was like, who the hell is this guy? And then I, and then there was links in there. And so then I went through the whole thing of your, you know, if you're learning, I think the example was Austrian. If you're learning Austrian and you're at a bar and they say something, you're going to remember it because it has an emotion attached to it versus just hearing mm. a word and stuff. And I think that was the example that he used on his blog. So shout out to Tim Ferriss and, uh, and uh, shout out to whoever else you want to shout out. But that's the first time that I saw you. So I bought your book. I, I think I even have, I still, I think I still have your app actually. Um, mm. And uh then I started talking to other people. I talked to Benny Lewis. I talked to Ali. Um, I'm, I'm talking to Joe. Uh, I don't know her last name, but she, but I think she's in the UK. She's another language. She doesn't have a company, but she's like in the space or whatever. Sure. Um, and, uh, and, and so, yeah, so I'm, I'm really excited to talk to you about Fluent Forever. Um, let's what, just, let's just start from the beginning. How did Fluent Forever come about? Um, and you know how many languages do you actually speak? Uh, so Fluent Forever's origins were like really messed up. Uh, <laughs> uh, I like I used to be an opera singer was kind of my career for ten years or so. And before that, I, I also got a degree in mechanical engineering because I was just a science nerd. And the opera thing was this like weird hobby that kind of exploded and, and took over. Um, and so the opera thing meant I needed to learn a lot of languages. The mechanical engineering side meant I was really good at problem solving uh, and, and had training in problem solving. And so uh, I needed to learn French, German, Italian, Russian, ideally. Um, and with four languages to learn, like if you can come up with better efficiency things for one of them, well, then suddenly you get four times the value. Like this is cool. <laughs> uh, and I was a, like efficiency nerd. It was just, hey, can I, can I min max this thing? Can I, can I spend one minute and get, you know, a minute and a half worth of value out of that minute? Um, but I sucked at languages. And so that was a problem. And I was jumping in a career that really required you to not suck at languages. So when you I say, stop, out, let me stop you yeah. real quick. When you say that, cause I hear this all the time. I suck at languages or I thought I sucked at languages. Yep. How did you think that you sucked at languages? What was your experience? It's, it's the experience of putting in time and not getting the thing back. So, which I think is this really, really common thing. So I put in okay. like seven years into Hebrew from ages like five to 13 or whatever. Uh, I guess five to 12, if you're going to be mathy um, and got nowhere. Uh, then I put in five and a half years into Russian and also got nowhere. And so like mm. what nowhere looked like for me was like today, my current Hebrew exposure is I can read the alphabet. I can sound okay in it. Um, I know how to say father, mother, yes, no. <laughs> uh, I used to remember the word for dog. I don't remember it anymore. Uh, you, I know the word, like the pronoun you, like, that's about it. Uh, no, I'm remembering the one for, for me. It's like the, basically there's going to be like 20 words. If I really push it for like 30 minutes, I'll, I'll, I'll finally pull up like 20 words in Hebrew. That's, that's pitiful. I mean, seven years of my life, like that's, that's, what did I do? <laughs> what was the point of any of those at that, that time? Um, with Russian, uh, when I started it over, like I eventually did learn Russian, but, um, by the at that point I was using these, these sort of new methods that I landed on. But before that point, like I had some speeches memorized, like that was it. I just, I had a, I had a long epic poem memorized the rhyming thing about like the, the, the Russian boogeyman who lives in Africa and like eats children. I had that memorized. That was my Russian. I, I oh. really couldn't, I had no real listening comprehension. If someone asked me some real basic questions of like, what's your name? Like I could kind of function my way through that. Maybe, <laughs> um, of the, you know, six you know, like flavors of, of like how you conjugate like nouns or, or decline nouns. Like I could get, get like two of them down. It's not a language. It was, it was just a, a jumble of some crap <laughs> like that clunky, I had memorized. Yeah. Super clunky. Yeah. So why do people fall into that job? What's the main thing? Like, what were you what were the study methods that you used that got you nowhere? And 
and why do people fall into that trap in general? Like, is, There's a like lot. why is it so common? The, the deal is that people tend to be learning the wrong. I mean, there's a few different deals, but the biggest one is that people tend to be learning the wrong information. So when, when I, there's an example I usually jump to, which is like the Hungarian word for camera. I'm like the Hungarian word for camera is finiki bezugi. And like anyone listening to this thing, if you don't have Hungarian experience, you have already forgotten that word. You forgot it like three seconds ago. Mm -hmm. And like, shit, like, <laughs> how do you have a chance <laughs> at this thing when a, you don't have the sound, like the, the ear training to actually remember any of it. Uh, and then B like, we'll get to this idea of like, are you learning the right thing at all? Um, so first chunk is about this ear training component. If I told you the Martian word for cameras, Mognog, you would have hold, held on to it. And so the problem with Finikape as you is that it, it's, it's all these sounds you never heard of. And so you're screwed. And so first barrier for language learning is this ear training thing. And if you don't do it in the beginning, you're always screwed. You never fix it. It's not a thing that fixes itself really. And so there's ways to fix that thing. And we can talk about that too, but like, that's your first thing. That's why languages get, get extra hard is because you're trying to encode information that your ears are like violently rejecting. Mm. So like that's barrier one. But barrier two, I think, is what really screws people because some people will show up in Spanish class and they'll have like Spanish will be close enough to English that you don't get completely screwed. Sometimes you have an American sounding teacher that they have like a really thick American accent because they actually never don't really speak Spanish. At that point, actually, that makes it easier to remember. I mean, easier to remember a fake language, but still like a fake mm -hmm. American sounding Spanish. Yeah, without but, the accent, yeah. Yeah, but still, like, <laughs> at least in the beginning, it helps actually a little bit for you to have this. I'm not recommending it, but it helps uh, from a memory standpoint. <laughs> but even so, like, when when I say something like, you know, the Hungarian word for camera is vinyikip, as you gave, um, or even like mognog is camera. When I say mognog, you're not thinking actually anything about cameras. You are not, when I say mognog, the first word that doesn't, like, the first thing, first thing that comes to mind is not, like, your iPhone or a shutter or a lens or mm -hmm. like these pictures you took for your whatever, like none of that comes to mind. You just are like, okay, Mognog camera, Mognog camera. You're trying to memorize the sound of two things and connect the sounds of those two things. And our brains are really good at uh, dumping sounds. Mm. Like this podcast, people are going to listen to this thing. And at the end of it, they're not going to remember every word that happened because that would be awful. If you memorized every single thing that everyone said around you at all moments, you would go crazy in yep. a day. Uh, and so our brains are like, oh, sounds? Screw sounds. I don't want that. Get, get that out of my head. Um, and yet then you jump into language learning. You're like, okay, let me try to memorize a whole bunch of sounds. Okay, Magna Camera, Magna Camera. Give me the next one. Okay, I'm going to memorize those two sounds. And that, like, you're fighting a losing battle and you will lose that battle. And so as long as you're sitting in a class trying to memorize the, tr the like two different sounds and stick them together, it, you're screwed. And that I, I would say is like the, the most central core of, of the problem. Which is interesting to think about because I don't think there's any language learning program that emphasizes that in stage one mm. uh, besides yours. It's, it's uncommon, I think partly because people really get the idea of Mognog is a camera. What's a Mognog? And you're like, mm -hmm. camera. Good job. You get a point. You win. <laughs> Gold star. And like, you feel good. And so like the, it's a really, really, it's expected of you. If you're going to open up a language app, you're supposed to like learn some translations. It's really easy to know whether you got it right or wrong. And then it's really easy to give you that little dopamine hit of, hit of you got it. Good job. Mm. And so like deviating from that is hard and it, it pisses people mm. off. They're like, well, where, where's the trick? Like, tell me, do the thing you're supposed to do. Like go dance yeah. monkey. Like there's a, there's an aspect of, <laughs> we want you to do the thing that we expect to see. And as right. soon as you move away from it, it, it gets people on edge. They're like, am I, are you wasting my time? Cause I, I you wasted, I, I had years of my life wasted back in high school. Are you doing it again to me? Do you think that's kind of why refold in the Matt versus Japan method works because thinking about it the only thing that's similar to you just listening and digesting the culture and the native tongue 
besides Fool and Forever is Refold. Mm. Now, Refold takes forever. You have to lock yourself in a room and watch 10,000 plus hours <laughs> of Japanese anime. Mm. But like my brother watches Japanese anime and he understands the sounds. He doesn't understand what they're saying, but he's picking up on it. Um, at very least, he's picking up on how they speak, right? Mm. Um, is that kind of why Refold works, but it just takes way longer? I mean, you can make a lot of things work. And if ultimately the thing that you're, you're getting is like, oh, when they say this, that happens. Mm -hmm. You know, when they say konnichiwa and then they wave, you're like, ah, cool. That's the, those are, those are two associated things. There's a waving thing. And then there's this konnichiwa and like, they say, seem to be excited to see me. Okay. Those are somehow connected at that point. Now you're trying, you're storing real meaning. Mm. You're storing something that's, that's much more than just, uh, you know, konnichiwa means hello or something where you're just like matching two sounds. Um, the issue is like, well, how many of those can you cram into your time? Because if you're watching anime and the one thing you see is the very first, like, Hey, konnichiwa. And then everything else is just gibberish and you didn't know what the hell's happening. And there's bombs flying and you don't know what's going on. And suddenly everyone's dead. Like, and, and they, you didn't really pick up any connections between any of the words to what's happening on the screen. Then. It, it it might eventually work if, but like yeah, it'll go real five slow. Years. Yeah, exactly. Well, I, I'm more so saying like just hearing how they like, like the sound of the words are mm. much are so different. Do you think even if you don't learn any vocabulary, you're in a better position of watching Japanese anime as a hobby, to just to understand this like the tonality of the language, and then you start learning vocabulary. I I think it can help to 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 do that focus of like, I just want to hear the sounds of it first, but like usually when you're watching Japanese anime uh, and you're not a Japanese speaker, you're not going to have the patience to actually listen in Japanese and have no subtitles. Like you're mm -hmm. going to be watching this with English subtitles. And so what you're really so doing you're reading is you're, the whole time, you're reading a storybook in English, you're improving your English vocabulary mm. and there's like Japanese background noise and that gives you a little bit, but not very much. I mean, what if you're hardcore, background, what if you if cut you're out the English and, and you listen to two Japanese subtitles, Japanese letters. So, so you're getting better there, but like, there's a, um, there's this threshold. So like, this is, this is one of these things where, like people talk about, oh, I, I have a kid. I want them to speak Mandarin. No one speaks Mandarin in the house. I'm just going to throw them in front of Mandarin Sesame street all day. And like, they'll learn, they won't learn. Um, they won't actually get better at Mandarin. They'll sit there and be like, why are you putting me in front of this thing? I don't understand. Um, but if you give them like a Mandarin nanny or something, you give them exposure so that they're starting to get enough because like the moment that you, uh, the thing you need is you need to be able to tie what you're seeing and like feeling in the world to the things you're hearing. And so if I go to you and I'm holding out this like delicious, like brown pastry thing, and I'm like, hi, this is the it. And I'm like showing you this thing. And you're like, that, that looks delicious. And I'm like. <laughs> Kexit, we just do I to kex it? And you're like, that that looks a lot like a like a cookie. Like it's a little like a German cookie, but like like hell yes, it's like kexa, whatever the hell you're saying. Like, yeah. Um at that point, you're actually starting to hold on to these concepts that like, oh, when someone offers me a, this this cookie looking thing and is like just do I need it, I should nod because then I'm gonna get the damn cookie. <laughs> at that point, you're making some real connections. Like that's what the kids are experiencing when they have that nanny and they're like used to the Vasa and you're like, and they hand them some water. And, and then the kid's like, uh, yeah, I guess I do. Yeah, I do want that water and I want the cookie and give me all the things. And you just use this Vils Duina thing over and over again when you, get, when you offered me things. So that's probably like a, a thing I should say yes to unless someone's handing me something that I don't want. Would you, would, would it be smart if you had a child to have a Mandarin speaking nanny and stack it with Mandarin shows? This is the thing. The moment that that kid has had a few months of exposure and is like, oh, I get that. And I get that. And I get that in Mandarin. Then you throw them in front of Sesame street and suddenly they start like growing really, really rapidly. Mm. It's this so, idea of, I need yeah. to understand what's in front of me and then, yeah, I'll grow from it. But if you're, if you're starting from nothing and it's just like, let's watch Mandarin news broadcasts, you're screwed. You're not getting enough. You, you can't actually improve from that. You need a handhold and then you can run with it. Right. So like, ideally, if you wanted your kid to speak five languages and he was born, you'd have five different nationalities of nannies. 
Um, you can't win you know, with five. There's, you have to have 30% <laughs> of their time spent in the language. So you can get up to like three and a half. Uh, there there are cases where kids will pick up like four or five languages, and I don't know how. Because all That's the research crazy. is like, you got to have 30% of their waking hours or more. So I was thinking like, if you could translate that into being an adult, right? Yeah. Uh, but it's almost impossible because it's like, okay, cool. Like if you're an adult and you would say, you, you know, you're a kid, you have a nanny, you're, you have a real life connection with someone that let's just say for the sake of the situation, they speak Mandarin, right? So you have <laughs> a, you have a Chinese nanny that's speaking Mandarin and that's going to help, right? It's like, here's cookie in Mandarin and what you don't understand. And then you, eventually you get that and then you stack it with other different tools. Yep. Um, so the first thing you would think about as an adult to mimic that, like the baby process is, okay, I'll just hang out with a bunch of Chinese people and mm -hmm. make Chinese friends that really don't speak English that much, which really would be almost impossible because you're not going to be friends with people that you don't speak their language. Sure. It would be really hard to connect with someone, right? You're not going to just walk into a group of Chinese people and be some random white dude and say, hey, I'm trying to learn Chinese, so I want to surround <laughs> myself with a bunch of Chinese people. They're right. going to look at you like you're a weirdo, uh, which makes sense. And they're right for looking at you like a weirdo because it's like, what? That's not how humans connect. They're, you're not, yeah. they're not your tutor. Um, but let's just say that you did have someone that is maybe a hybrid that speaks English and Chinese, which a lot of people do. Uh, and you just hang out with Chinese people that are from, you know, China and they speak Mandarin dialect. Uh, I don't think it would actually help as much. It, it would definitely help versus zero, but I don't think it would help to the degree of baby because people understand that babies don't know anything. So you are more willing to deal with the what, huh, huh, confused look. As an adult, we have no patience. It's like you're a grown man. I'm not going to sp spend my time trying to, you know, explain to you that this th thing means this, but as a baby, the babies don't know anything. They don't talk. So you're kind of forced to be patient with the baby because you know that it's not capable. Right. So it's almost impossible to mimic that baby, uh, that baby method into adulthood. I mean, it is and it isn't, it's almost impossible to have that mimicked for free. <laughs> I mean, the deal That's is ad adults are transactional. They become more and more transactional over time. Yep. And so like, A, yeah, you can pay someone to do it. But B, you can also like exchange a thing and be like, hey, you want English. I want Mandarin. Let's spend some time with you being patient with me. And then I'm going to spend some time being patient with you. Uh, and so you can, you can get the baby stuff that you want. And it, the, you're paying with something, with time, with effort, with, with patience. To, to get the kind of patience that you're talking about that you kind of offer for free to babies. But don't you think it's different though, when we're just learning stuff? Cause I've been on italki and, and, and all that stuff. And we'll get into all the different tools that people can use, but don't you think it's a little bit different when you're in a situation where, okay, now it's time to learn a language. How do you say, how are you in this, in this verb and that, don't you think it's a little, when you force it, it doesn't really stick as well as just being around people that speak that language and just seeing certain stuff? Because I had a, I had a Spanish uh, janitor in high school and mm -hmm. every time she'd come by with trash and she would, she would scream out basura, basura, basura. And yeah. eventually it got to the point where I knew that she's pushing a trash can. I knew that basura means trash. Right. So I'll never forget the translation of trash to basuda, but mm -hmm. it wasn't like I went to her and I was like, how do you say trash in Spanish? If she would have said, oh, it's easy. It's basuda. Mm -hmm. I would have never remembered that. You would not have remembered it. You're so, right. So that's kind of how a lesson is. It's like, how do you say this? And how do you use this phrase? Well, you do it this, this, and that, but it's not a real life transaction and you're not in person or like, most of the time, I, I will, I talk over the internet. So there's, there's uh, you're, you're already starting behind the, you know, the goal line because it, just not being in person, I think makes a difference as well. You correct me if I'm wrong with that, but it's not forced when you hang out with a bunch of Spanish people and they're saying words in Spanish, eventually you pick up on it, uh, which is completely different than paying someone for like a lesson. What's your thoughts on that? So I think the thing that you're right, you, you, you've, you've nailed right here is the, the reason that like, it's the same janitor, right? Yep. That you're talking about. You have this janitor that's walking by and saying, basura, basura, and like holding this trash can. Mm -hmm. And that you're, you've, you spotted that if you went to that janitor, 
same exact person in front of the same trash can. And we're like, what's the word for trash? And she was like, basura, that you wouldn't have remembered it. Exactly. Everything is the same except for your question. Your question is about a translation. Your question is not about the thing that's actually there. And so when you're talking about these interactions, the problem is that there's a giant trap there, which is that we're taught that the way you get language out of someone is you ask them to translate things when that's actually not the way you get language out of someone. The way you get language out of someone is you say, hey, tutor that I, I, I hired off of italki, I need to talk about this thing that I'm gonna mm -hmm. hold up in front of the Zoom thing and be like, what's this? <laughs> and they're like, flash it. And I'm like, flash it? And they're like, can you write that out? And they're like, flash it. And I'm like, okay, what's in this? And they're like, vasa. And I'm like, how do I, like, okay, flash, vasa inside flash it? And they're like, vasa in, in, in the flash. Mm. And I'm like, oh, okay, okay, cool. Like, now what am I doing? And like, you start, you can actually like, do things. And the moment that you're doing things and they're describing what you're doing and you're like, okay, can I start using the language I know to talk to you and ask you questions? How mm -hmm. do I say, not just how do I, like, how do I say, how do I say in German? Can we have that discussion? How do I get to meaning from the words that I have? Um, there was a person who gave like a guest talk in one of our coaching things that like super cool idea. Um, they had, uh, they were a linguist and they'd figured out that there's this, um, there's this set of 65 words. 65 concepts that are shared across all languages that can define all other words. Mm. So like it, like super crappy definitions, like really long, long winded things, <laughs> but they're like, okay, well, you know, what is it to, to, to tell a lie? This is, uh, you, you say truth, you, sorry, you say not truth, but you want <laughs> other person believe is truth to say a lie. <laughs> and so it's like these really clunky things, but that's enough to define every single word in every language. Mm. Like get to that stuff, start talking about things with, with shitty caveman language mm. of like, Hey, I, I, I ears, ear thing, ear, what did this ear thing? And they're like, uh, what are you talking about? And I'm like, okay, here, I, I hear you now ear thing. And they're like headphones, headphones. Cool. Let's talk about my headphones. I just bought new headphones. Like, can we have those sorts of conversations when you have that with your italki tutor? Well, you're, you're not pointing. Think, th uh, yeah, but you're, you're on a pointing. video chat. No, 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 no. What I'm saying is this is crucial. I think people are going to overlook mm. this. You're yeah. pointing. You're not saying, how do I say headphones? You're right. pointing without saying the English word. Yes. That's crucial. Yes. Pe most people hearing this, they would yes. have missed that. They would have missed that. Thank you. I'm like, we were on a podcast. This is not video. Um, <laughs> really important. Yes. You pointing, you making just like gesture is our first language. It's not our native language. Like native language is gestural first. And so if, if you are on a video call with a tutor, you can point to all sorts of things. You can ask questions that are, that are gestural and you can, and you can like write out shit and be like, Hey, like I have Gabriel. Yeah. But, the, what, but, what? You, but you're making a point, no point intended. You're mm -hmm. making a point to point at things specifically. Not, you're mm -hmm. not saying the English word. And then not say the English word. The not saying the English word is like the best possible thing you can do for those sessions. Even okay, when you're at the beginning. That. It's yeah. huge. Because the moment you say the English word, your brain goes into lazy mode. Hmm. It is so easy to say basura is the word for trash. That the moment that that is offered that your brain's like, oh, that's an option. I don't have to think. I don't have to think about like the dirtiness of the basura. I don't need to think about the smell of the basura. I, I just have to think trash, basura, basura. Okay, the same thing, whatever. Mm -hmm. Then your brain dumps it. Like it, it's, it, you, you, are, you are fighting this fight with this, this really smart tool that is designed to dump everything in front of you out of itself. And the only way you win is by, by coming up with strategies to say, no, no, no brain. <laughs> What, what does the basura look like? What does it smell like? What goes in basura? And how is basura different than the concept that I'm not going to say out loud, but is trash? Like, just like, what is that mm -hmm. thing? Um, there's a thing that I, I talk about in my book a lot about um, images, where if I look for dog on Google Images, I see everything that I expect to see. Because I'm an English speaker, and I know what I expect to see from dog, and Google Images is really good at delivering that thing. <laughs> um, but if I search for perro, on Google images, there's different dog breeds there. 
because Spanish bloggers have a different set of concepts that they think of when they think of perro. It's the same species. It's exactly the same concept. How could it be different? And yet it is different. You can see it immediately. Mm. There's like a really, really like huge example where like the, um, the, the Russian word for, for girl, devushka. You, you look for girl on Google Images, you see everything you expect to see. You look for Dievushka, you find a bunch of 18-year-old sex objects in bikinis, like exclusively. Not forgetting and, that. And you're like, what is going on here? Like, this is, <laughs> this is not, where's, where's my seven-year-old niece? Why mm. is she not included in this word? And it's because actually Russian has two different words for that. There's Dievushka, the diminutive of that thing, that means like, ah, the little girl. And there's Dievushka, which in the Russian culture is like, is very sexualized. And mm. like, you can have whatever thoughts you have about that thing. You could be like, that's shitty, or that's like a problem with the culture. You could be like, haha, that's super cool. Whatever you think, it doesn't matter. The moment that you recognize that Dievushka and girl actually are not the same concept, the moment you see that, then now this is something new. And like, we're good at learning things that are new. We're just not good at trying to like memorize copies of things where we're memorizing sounds. So why mm. if you go into like a, a Mexican restaurant and, and like you've never had a huarache and then you're like, what's, there's a whole section on the menu of huaraches and they have all kinds of different things. And you're like, I don't know what the hell that is. And you're like, what can you, what is that? <laughs> and they, they, they show you this thing and they're like, it's, the, and you're like, I don't even know what that is. It just looks like it has, a, it's a thing with meat on it. And they're like, it's good. You want one? And you're like, yeah, I'll, I'll get the huarache. Give me whatever one you want. And then you eat it and you find like, it's this like fried, like, bread thing and it's like crunchy and there's meat all over it and it's like super delicious mm. who is not going to remember huarache you just learned a new word even just talking about it the people like listening anyone listening to this is like well that sounds good i kind of want a huarache um you just learned a new word where instead of if i was like huarache is the word for fried device thing fried thing with meat on it or a sandwich if i went that was just like open face sandwich that's the word for huarache which is like the same deal with the girl thing where it's like, yeah, they're, they're close enough. I can pretend they're the same word. Um, what well, is not in fact the word for open face sandwich it's the, it's the word for this cool thing that anytime you hit, go to a restaurant, you, you order something new, you memorize that new word instantly because we're good at that thing. Yeah. Yeah. I, I definitely think that's, uh, an easier thing to start with while, when learning a language, cause you know, Oh, if something tastes good, you're obviously going to remember it. Yeah. Like shishimi, you know, anything, even yeah. e Obviously we use, we say burrito in America, I guess it's pronounced barrito, but I don't look at barrito and say, oh, wow, this is a burrito that is wrapped and you know, it's basically like a wrap, but Mexican style. No, it's like a burrito is a fucking burrito. It's you know burrito. what I mean? Yeah. Exactly. It's just not, like basura. Not a wrap. Yeah. Just like basura is, is trash. I don't think of, oh, that basura is actually trash in translator, right? Because we have like a foreign object, right? Um, so if you're on, oh, sticking on the italki, if you're on italki with someone, but mm -hmm. you only have so many objects around you, eventually you're going to run out. Would it be beneficial just to have like a picture book and just like go through everything? <laughs> like, what is this? Okay, cool. Turn the page. What is this? Or do you actually have to have like a physical object, like a case or, you know, a, a phone or something? The deal is that you can initially pointing to things and having some pictures is super handy. So like, yes, um, you, you being able to have a zoom conversation where you have like Google images open and you can start popping some stuff open there, super handy. Like that's useful to force that conversation. Mm -hmm. But as soon as you have enough language and by enough, I mean, not very much like caveman language, like mm -hmm. I like, drink, drink liquid, drink liquid, good, like, like sweet liquid. Yeah, yeah. As soon as you have this like hundred, 200 word vocabulary where you can fumble around, then the moment you define something in your target language with the target language, you have accomplished the same thing as being able to point to it. So the moment that I, I have, like I, I've done all my pointing and I'm like, okay, okay, I just, I bought this thing. Okay, so I buy a computer thing and they're like, okay, computer thing. And I'm like, okay, I buy computer thing. It, 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 all information inside computer thing. And they're like, uh, okay. That's a, and I'm like, little, little box, little box computer thing, all information in box. And they're like, hard drive, hard drive. I bought a hard drive yesterday. Then I didn't need to point to it. I just created the word in the target language in a way that actually will stick. Mm. And so what yeah, you're looking you're really to do, testing. 
You're really testing you're, these teachers. <laughs> absolutely. No, it, it, the teaching process is, it requires an enormous amount of patience to really deal with the fact that you don't know what the hell you're talking about, but that's what you're paying them for. And that's okay. And they're okay with it if they know what the game is. And so if mm. you're telling them the game is, please help me just, just sit with me and deal with the fact that I'm an idiot in your language, but I still need to not speak English. So can I just fight my way through it? Will you just sit with me for that fight? And every time that I have a word that I don't know, can you please like guess as to what the hell I'm talking about? And can we force our way through a conversation? And so you can try to have these kind of like me just saying, I bought a comp like a hard drive yesterday. That could be a 10 minute fight. But over that 10 minute fight, I am actually practicing fluency. I'm practicing the ability to think in the language and I'm leaning on this person to help me get there. And that process does all the connections because the moment that I finally have that fight, and I'm like, okay, hard drive? And I'm like, yeah, hard drive, hard drive. I bought a hard drive yesterday. Then what I've assembled is I've managed to connect this new concept of hard drive to computer, to box, to information, to bot, to yesterday. All of those words just link together. And like, those are the associations that are real fluency. Those are the associations that, you're at, that, that mm -hmm. you have in English. Hard drive is connected to drive. It's connected to spinning. It's connected to Toshiba. It's connected to like all that, that stuff is connected in your native language. You got to reconstruct it in the new language. If you're going to have any chance of speaking the thing and the, the translation thing has nothing to do with that, mm -hmm. but fighting through does. And so that, that, that fight that you do that, that patience thing, you need to ask of your teachers. That's actually the real language learning process. And it, it feels like it could be slower. Like, man, I just spent 10 minutes getting a hard drive. Like I could have asked that in 10 seconds, but in practice, you're going way, way, way faster. And, and you're, you're making all the associations that you needed to make, to make it so that the next time you want to describe something, you'll describe it even faster. Yeah, no, I think that's uh, definitely crucial. Uh, that one word, you can learn a bunch of words really fast and remember zero, yes. or you can take the time to learn one word and never forget it. Like basura, uh, that, I, yeah, yeah. Well, I've been on italki. Sometimes these people come with their own lessons. Do you kind of have to stop them from the get-go and be like, listen, yes. I, I know you have your lesson, but I'm not trying to be rude. However, I have a way that I want to learn specifically. Uh, so that's how we're going to do it. Exactly that. You need to fight them. Um, <laughs> you do. You do. You just need, you, I mean, usually it's why I actually like italki specifically because they have this division between the teachers and the community people. Because the community mm. people, they're like, I don't care. Just, I'm, I, I want to be able to chat with someone. Maybe right. my thing and, and we'll spend some time together. Whereas the teachers, they're like, I have a lesson plan. I have training in this. Like, let me do the, do, let me do the thing I learned how to do. Um, the teachers are good. Like there's not, I, I'm not saying, I, I don't want to give language teachers a bad rap because like language teachers are amazing and they've, they've honed an art of like, how do you describe really complicated things like grammar and things like that to people mm -hmm. that is useful at times and it's useful in the right dosages and it's useful for the right purposes. But, um, the issue is that like language teachers get this, this unfair job laid on them, which is, okay, cool. So I want to learn Mandarin. So fix it for me, person, <laughs> make it happen. <laughs> dance. Uh, there's this, there's this expectation of them to like, do the, do the language dance and do it well. Mm -hmm. And what people expect to see is, well, that means you're going to give me a whole curriculum based on grammar. So do your dance. And so they show up with, with nine, really like 95 students out of 96, like basically saying, I'm expecting you to do the dance. And then you got this one student coming in being like, no, no, don't do any of that dance. I want you to just talk about my hard drive. And they're like, yeah. well, wh what? <laughs> no, exactly. like I got my thing. I know how to do my thing. I just got used to this finally. So, uh, it's, it's not on the teachers. It's not like these teachers are crappy. They are not crappy. Uh, it's, it's the, it's the societal expectations around language learning that are crappy. But the tradition or the traditional language learning process isn't as effective. It's, it's not, it's, you know, yeah. cause if that, I, yeah. I can't tell you, you know, better than anyone definitely know better than me, how many people tr like the actual numbers, right? We can, I have an idea, but you have the idea of people that start learning languages and just drop off the cliff. Yep. Uh, it's very high. So the traditional yep. language learning process doesn't really work. And maybe it's boring. Maybe it's not engaging. Uh, maybe they don't have a real passion for the culture. They're just trying to learn Spanish. But what if you don't like Spanish culture? You really like Japanese culture, right. but Japanese way harder. So let's just speak Spanish because I live in America and there's more Spanish. I'm going to utilize Spanish more. Japanese would be a waste of time. I'm never going to live in Tokyo. Uh, 
but you love Japanese culture, yep. but it's just not, I guess some people could see that as a waste of time that aren't into languages, but you can't yeah. follow Spanish uh, because you're not into Spanish. You, you're not into Spanish culture. You're into Japanese culture. So yeah, I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of holes. And I think people like you and Ali definitely have filled those gaps. Um, my biggest, one of my biggest issues in, you know, pointing to this saying this, you know, telling the iTalkie teacher, you're pointing to an object. But what happens when you have to re remember words like the, there, like words that you need for every conversation, the, like the filler words, how do you associate that in like a neuroscience way? Cause to say the word to, or, or there's no, mm -hmm. like, I, can, I don't associate or with the image. Right. Um, so let's say we're talking about the, like the, the preposition by it's like a real super abstract preposition. Like what the hell is by look like? What does it mean? Anything like that. Um, now by like shows up in all sorts of different stories. Like I'm standing by the bus. This is a book by Shakespeare or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, but it doesn't look like anything on its own, but the moment that you say, okay, well let's pick one story. This is a book by Gabe. Screw it. Talk about my own thing. I'm like I'm looking at this book and it's like, this is a book by me. Like I wrote this thing. This is by me. Um, then suddenly the story looks like something. There's a person holding a book, looking at it being like, I wrote this book. This is my book. I, this is a book by me. Like that by is the word you need to tell that story. If you want to say a, a di like anything about who, who wrote that thing, you got to use that word. And so by isn't some weird abstract, like gobbledygook that means nothing. Like by is the thing that lets me say the thought I want to say. And like, I, I do most of my stuff via flashcards. It's everything is how do I have a super intense experience? And then how do I store it on a flashcard so I can remind myself about that experience tomorrow and then a week later and et cetera. Um, because flashcards are what help you retain stuff. It's not because flashcards are sexy. It's just because actually asking questions is sexy. <laughs> like, like someone asking yeah. you the question, what's, what do I, what, what's the information that I learned yesterday? That's the only sexy thing. Flashcards happen to be a convenient way to do it. It's, I'm not, I don't have some other thing with flashcards, it's just handy, handy way to answer, ask questions. Um, but like, you need those two pieces. You need, you need someone to ask you questions and then you need like a really, really intense experience that is not translation based. And so this experience of how do I have an interesting experience with like, this book is by me. Well, that's this experience of talking to a tutor or whatever it is that you need to be like, oh, that's the, this is the story I want to tell. But then that second component, well, what does that look like? How do I hold on to that later? Well, that's a sentence like this book is blank me with a picture of someone holding a book and being like, like pointing at the book, be like, this is my book, like, like th that thing. And there's only one word that fits in that, that slot, that, that fill in the blank thing. And that's by, and that's what by looks like. There's a different by, and that book, that one looks like I'm standing blank the bus by like a person near a bus being like, this is where I am. <laughs> by, that's what by looks like. And every one of these abstract words looks like something because they're always used in the context of telling real stories that you need. If it was some random word that was just gobbledygook that's abstract such that you would never ever encounter it, well, then you don't even need that word. But every word like or, like you need that thing. You're like, do you want the cookie or the pizza? And you're like, well, uh, the pizza clearly. And like, it's the story that lets you tell that there's multiple options that, and you want one of them. And so suddenly it becomes really, really concrete. The problem with grammar tends to be people try to learn it in this abstract form where they're like, okay, uh, you know, the conjugation chart for to be, he is, she is, I am, <laughs> you are. And it's like, you are what? <laughs> just are you exist? Like, is that what we're talking about? Or are we talking about like, you are a student or like, she is burning on fire. Like, or he is freaking out. Like those are real sentences that have real stories that look like things. Uh, but, but we have this, this belief that like the right way to learn a language is like, no, 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 that's, that's too, that's too concrete. Now you're, you're telling kids stories instead of like the, the right way to do it is to learn some abstract crap about you are, he is. And as soon as you live in that abstract realm, then your only option is to translate. There are no images and then you're going to forget it. You know, what's interesting to me is this is a little, uh, off topic, 
from well, it's, it's on topic, but off from what we were just talking about, but I don't want to forget this. I have a guy that I know he speaks three languages, but he didn't learn those languages as an adult. He speaks mm-hmm. three languages. He's from Africa. Yep. He speaks French, yep. but he's Lebanese. He's half, his mom is from Paris and his dad is from Lebanon. Yep. So he's Arabic, but he's born in Benin, um, a, con- a country in Africa. They speak French, but he also speaks Arabic because he's Lebanese mm-hmm. and then he speaks English. So that's three languages. He can speak different dialects. He can speak Egyptian Arabic. He can speak Lebanese Arabic. He can speak all these different types of Arabic, Saudi Arabic, everything, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, but he has a hard time learning Spanish and other languages, mm-hmm. but he knows three. Mm-hmm. On the flip side, I know people that they only learned another language as an adult, and they're able to learn multiple languages super fast, but they only knew one native language versus my friend that knows three fluent and in different dialects of, you know, for his, in his case, Arabic. Yep. So for people that don't know this, uh, Arabic has multiple different dialects. Every language has different dialects. Mexican Spanish is different from Argentinian Spanish. Saudi Arabia, Arabic is different than um, Egyptian Arabic. Uh, so if you don't know what we're talking about, that's what we're talking about. Um, so why is it? that once somebody learns a language that they're able to learn multiple at basically like warp speed versus someone that does speak multiple languages because they, you know, their parents are different nationalities and they grew up that way, but they have a hard time learning Spanish, which is compared to Arabic for English speakers supposed to be super easy. Um, Is it just, you? I mean, my guess is that once you learn your process, you just apply it to everything and it's, it doesn't matter what it is like, doesn't matter if it's yep. learning archery or it's learning how to speak Korean. It's this is how you this is the best way for me to learn and how to kind of be like a Tim Ferriss and break it down in a systematic process. Is that why people learn multiple things faster after they learn the first one? You got to learn how to learn. It's part of the it's like the first step of the whole process is learning how like what your process is. And like mm-hmm. I made like and I think it's one of the things that I I got a huge advantage of for myself because of this opera thing was that usually people have one language to learn. And then they're like, I, I want to learn Spanish. That's my goal. If I learn Spanish, I'm done. I'm never going to learn another thing. I want Spanish. Give me the one thing. <laughs> and so you do your one thing and you stumble through. You learn it with a bunch of crappy methods because why would you succeed? Why would you be brilliant at learning languages the first time you try? And so you try your translation stuff. And you're like, ah, it didn't really work real well for me. And I tried this thing and someone had this, this cool like mnemonic system and I used it and I learned a few words that way. And then I tried this app and it made me really motivated. I tried that. And so you're doing a million things, half of which don't work, but eventually you stumble your way through and you figured out, hey, like 50% of these things did work. And for the people who are like, well, that was cool. I want to do it again. Well, now they're starting from the base of, okay, I'm going to try the 50% of things that did work and maybe I'll find another thing that works even better. <laughs> and so they get better and better at the literal skill of learning languages. In my case, I got to do it over and over and over again. I had those four languages at, at the start. Eventually, I've like at this point, I'm at like eight. And I've, I, I got addicted not to speaking languages. I didn't get addicted to finding people and talking to them. I got addicted to the process. And so like I picked up, I'm picking up Japanese now because it's hard, not because of like, also I'm interested in Japanese culture, stuff like that, but like, I'm interested in how to learn it because mm-hmm. I, I picked up a hobby of learning skills, but people don't have the time for that. That's not good. That happens to be my job. I got lucky, but most people have too much shit to do. And so the idea of like, just stumbling in, you have to stumble your first time. And then if you're only going to do it once, you're just going to stumble. Um, well, you learn so multiple that- languages in the beginning because of you know, uh, singing opera, that was your yeah. career at the time or what you were doing, uh, besides mechanical engineering. But, uh, do you know who Robert Greene is? He wrote the 48 laws of power, um, mm. mastery, art of seduction, art of war. So he's probably one of my favorite authors of all time. I've read all his books. I'm reading the daily laws now, his newest book. Mm. Um, and he's amazing when it comes to psychology and in his book mastery, uh, one of the, one of the key points is it's impossible to become a master at multiple things. Everyone that is a master has laser focus on one thing that they get extremely good at, and then they move forward. So if you, so having said that, right. Cause I think Robert Greene is, is a brilliant author and a super genius. Um, and he says that if you want, if you truly want to become a master at anything, it doesn't matter if it's horseback riding or speaking in Japanese, you, 
solely have to focus on that one thing. Mm -hmm. um, so does that necessarily, so to me, I read that as to become an amazing, like if I close my eyes, I think I'm talking to a Japanese person, but it's not, it's you as a white guy, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like that's like mastery to me. Like if I close sure. my eyes, I don't know who's in the room, yep. but did you learn those multiple languages at like 80% because you learned multiple at once, but you weren't like a true master at all of them. So the, like, I like the, I hate the word fluency, which is like, like the, uh, too bad because yeah. it's my company name. <laughs> uh, forever, it's, baby. It's, it's rough, but <laughs> it doesn't mean any, like fluency means I feel good. And someone can feel good with order, like knowing how to order a coffee and someone else can never feel good because they're an anxious person like me. Uh, and so like, there's <laughs> this, like fluency is a really, really tricky thing as a concept, but, um, I like the European scale because the Europeans are like, screw fluency. Like how much do you know? <laughs> Do you know enough to go to college? Do you know enough to do like this, this job? Like here's a certification test. It takes three hours. It costs 300 bucks. And we're going to know what you know. And then we're going to know what you can, we can hire you to do. Uh, and so the European scale of going like A0, I don't know a damn thing. A1, A2, B1, B2, C1, C2. And like C1, you can teach courses in college and you can comfortably attend college. B2 is generally like you can really kind of function in most cases, but you get screwed when like your, your gas cap blows off in your rental car and you're like, ah, the, 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 the car thing, the, the, the thing, no, no gas in the thing. Like then you just fall apart. Uh, yeah. you can stumble through, but it's rough. Like that's B2. Um, and so for me, my goal with a lot of these languages was like, I want to be able to think in this thing. I want to mm. be able to have a conversation and like talk about some stuff that's important to me. Uh, but like, I'm okay with the gas cap problem. Like I'll stumble through. That's fine. If, and so for me, I would say, uh, like German is C2. I lived there a long time, all that thing. Um, French was C1, Russian was like, uh, I qualified a B2 C1. So I got right in between those two in the tests. Um, then like Spanish got to like a B2, uh, Hungarian probably got to B2, Japanese is probably B2. So these are all like gas cap problems. Um, Italian <laughs> probably was like a B1. Uh, and I think that's the, that's the set of them. And so like, I got them to this point where I could think and like converse and like really hold the thing. Are, did I hold them all there? No. Um, there's people out there who are like the polyglots who are like, this is my thing. I'm a polyglot. Like I want to be a master of all of as many languages as I can. And of like mm -hmm. really having them active. And those are people who have like, like three hour practice sessions every day. Like, this is their thing. Like they, they do a rotation. There's like, I'm going to do writing practice on this language while I do speaking practice on that language. Like just blam, 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 blam. I don't do that. I don't have time for that thing. And it's also not my interest. The thing that I want to be a master of is learning techniques, not the languages themselves. I like this, this, this accumulation of knowledge experience. I like the thing of like, oh, mm -hmm. my brain's doing a new thing. And so if I can get there and I'm happy with it, then I'm done and I'll leave it to go, to go like suffer like it, it will degrade over time um but the neat thing is that once you hit that point of like oh i can think in that language and i can mm -hmm. kind of converse and be comfortable um that will degrade yeah yeah but you can get it back in like two weeks mm -hmm. whereas if i was just memorizing a bunch of information and translations and stuff you don't get to get that back because you didn't build anything in the first place right but like i i remember when i was trying to record these you have to do street cred videos whenever you're a language blogger you're like i speak all this stuff look at me blah 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 uh, and I remember recording this back in like 2013 and I had lost my French. I couldn't remember a damn thing. Mm. It was 2015 yeah. actually. Um, and I was like, fuck, I, could, I can't speak French. I just said I could speak French. Um, and then I watched like, uh, 24, like the, the Kiefer Sutherland dubbed into French. I watched mm. two seasons of that thing over two weeks, just binge watched it. And then two weeks later, I'm dreaming in French again. I got the whole thing back. And so well, you're dreaming point, in French. Yeah, I got to dreaming in French after those two weeks because I had a foundation. I had something that really meant something. And and yeah, I forgot most of it and I couldn't come up with a French sentence, but then then I could. And so that that dropped a lot of the pressure of like, man, I need to keep all these maintained. Like I don't. I can just jump back into TV and get them back. Mm -hmm. Um but I built the thing and I built a thing to to each of those levels. So I kind of target I tend to target this kind of B2 level of falling apart when the gas cap breaks, but otherwise being pretty good. Um, Japanese, I want to get to C1, C2. Like I, I really love that language. Like I, I just, 
but that's going to take me, you know, another year or two. And it's, it's, it's a hike. Japanese is, is one of the biggest hikes period for English speakers. Do you plan on going to Japan? I love Japan. Japan's my favorite place in the world. And it's, it's why, like, I just, I've fallen in love with that language and with that culture, all sorts of stuff. Like that is an amazing, amazing construct yeah. that people have come up with. Yeah. How's the, I feel like if you go to Tokyo, it's like super, super high tech. You can yeah. get like dinners out of a claw machine or something like this crazy. <laughs> what's the crazy, what's the cra side, side topic? We'll talk about Tokyo. What's the craziest technological advancement you've seen in Tokyo versus what we have here? I you mean, know, in Chicago, where you are. The, the ubiquity, <laughs> the ubiquity of bidets is my actual answer yeah. to your question that you can go into the, just the, the shittiest, like, like ferry, like, like for just getting across a river, it's just this run down dump of a thing. And you go into this just pristine bathroom where the toilet's like, hello, welcome, please sit on me. Let me just, whatever, uh, just that wow. I'm going to go for that as my Japanese answer people are question. super clean and organized. I mean, once you go there, like <laughs> I went to Japan and then when I came back and I, I moved to Chicago from LA, the first thing that arrived in Chicago, like before <laughs> I arrived at Chicago was, was the bidet I ordered as a result of being in Japan. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. Going from LA to, to Japan, it's like, wow, LA is really dirty. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> I lived in LA for, uh, almost five years. Yeah. Mm. I lived in yeah. Hollywood, West Hollywood, all, you know, all the different areas, Sherman Oaks. So yeah. No, I grew uh, up in Sherman Oaks, so I spent a lot, a lot of time there. Oh, okay. So yeah, you know, Van Nuys, all the, all the good spots. Uh -huh. Um, so do you think, what's your take on this? Do you think that it's a good idea to learn the easiest language to your native language first to kind of get, I guess you could say the confidence and the technique down for instance, so English is a Germanic or a, a Germanic language, right? It is mostly and a Germanic language. Yeah. So that is German, I think Dutch and a couple other ones, right? So would it be beneficial if you have even a slight interest in learning German to start with German, because it's going to maybe come easier because it's in the same realm versus like a lot, um, you know, a Latin language or, you know, to de de uh, derive from, you know, over an you know, overseas language, like a Chinese language or something? Usually my answer to that is no. Um, usually what I, when people are like, what language should I learn? Uh, my usual question back to them is like, well, why are you doing this in the first place? Mm. Like, wh why don't, right. <laughs> can I convince you not to learn a language? Like give, give me some passion behind it. <laughs> like, tell me you want to learn it because something you care about something. And then usually what comes out is like, they do people are like, well, like, yeah, I know I'm supposed to learn Spanish. It's like usually the answer. Like, I know I'm supposed to learn Spanish, so that's probably the one I should learn. I'm like, yeah, but, but don't. <laughs> what if you didn't learn Spanish? What would you learn? And they're like, well, like, I've always just Iceland's so cool. Like, I just, I always wanted to be in Iceland. And like, they're, I love what they sound like. And I listen to Iceland music and just like, like I love the way the alphabet looks. And it's just so cool. And I'm just like, <laughs> who listens to Iceland Icelandic music? That's a special person. <laughs> I mean, this is the thing. It's like, there's people, like, people have like all sorts of crazy, <laughs> awesome passions. And then they try to like dump that and be like, well, I guess you're supposed to learn yeah. Spanish. Like if you're going to well, learn Spanish, because it's like, most useful, love Spanish. useful, right? It's the most but useful screw, in screw useful. Like that's yeah. not, this is too much work. You're talking about hundreds of hours of your life. If the thing you need is I just want to order a damn taco. You can do that. You got that yeah. down. It's over. You, you just pull on your Google translate and do it. That's not, don't learn a language because you got to order a taco. Mm. Like learn a language because you're, you're interested in, in expanding how your brain works, learn it because you're interested in like, like having a whole new network of people that you want to connect with. Like there's a million great reasons because like, you don't want Alzheimer's. Like there's a lot of fabulous reasons <laughs> to learn a language, but because someone told me I was supposed to, cause I guess it's useful is a terrible reason to learn a language. And it's, you're not, it's not going to push you through. If it was good mm. enough to get you all the way through, then sure. Have a crappy reason. That's, that'll be fine. The problem is when you're talking about something that's that many hours, when it's like, it's, it's a marathon, it's marathon training is what it is. And if the right. reason you're running a marathon is because someone told you it was a good idea, you're not actually going to show up on that day and run all 26 miles. I think I read in your book, um, with the, with the German language, you said, if you speak German or you learn German, you start to think differently. Mm -hmm. Um, and 
I, I was curious, and obviously you weren't in front of me. Now you are. Uh, what did you mean by that? What What is learning? How is learning German making you think different differently? Is it similar to other languages where they, I guess you could say they speak backwards in in English terms, or do they just have a completely way of completely different way of describing things? There is there is really minor stuff when it comes to looking at each language individually and being like, well, what is the character of that language and how does that influence you? So like, uh, there's stuff like you know, German identifies everything with a masculine, uh, female, or neuter gender, and so there's a sense of like, you know, die Sonne is like this feminine sun, and there's a concept of the sun being kind of like this nurturing thing, whereas in other languages it's it's masculine, and so it has this kind of like ah, the sun produces heat and force. Yeah, the sun is sun. Uh, yeah. Right. And so like there, there, there are aspects of that that really are different from language to language, but they're subtle and they're tiny. Um, the stuff that matters, like the stuff that I was talking about there about like, it changes you. It's about the, the, the context with which you, like when you learned the thing and who you were during that time. And so my, like my best example of that is Italian, like Italian, I learned in Italy, in Perugia. It's the center of Italy. It's like in Umbria, like the, this gorgeous, like just mountainous region that's full of beautiful people who are super kind, who all want to feed you the best possible food that you will ever encounter in your life. <laughs> and everything is like, like at that time was like really cheap. And then you could just go on a train anywhere all the time and just go to Rome and have the best gelato you've ever had in your life. And then go to Cinque Terre and like have the most amazing like coconut gelato while you're looking over the beaches and just like crying from how beautiful it is. And like, that's Italian for me. The idea of like gelato is not ice cream. Like, yes, it is ice cream, but like, no, gelato is me sitting at like in Rome putting a thing in my mouth and being like, holy shit, this is so, how do they do it? <laughs> yeah, That's gelato. That's every word in Italian. That's, that's right. me having like a, like a, a super animated conversation with our host of like, why for him, the, the point of pizza is that it makes you orgasm in your mouth and him just be, and like trying to express this thing with his hands, which is like, <laughs> oh my, oh my, an orgasmo. And like, he's just like freaking out. And you're like that, like that's Italian. And it's not because of literally the language it's because I had so like every memory that I connected to those words was connected to that stupidly good experience. Mm. Whereas like so there's German special about German. It's no, no, like, like German, my German experience was me like having like fights with my landlord about like whether they're going to like <laughs> sue us or not for like all sorts of stuff. So like German is a stressful language for me. But like also this language of, of music and like learning, because like I, I got my master's degree there and I was spoke like I learned all sorts of really cool stuff. And so German is a language of expertise and like me, my, me putting my shit together, whereas Italian is a language of food and fun and relaxation. And so they're each excerpts of my life. Like Italian mm. is tw 2008, Gabe, whereas German is like 20, 2007 to 2013, Gabe. And so it's, it's this piece of me that anytime I switch into that language, suddenly it's like, well, there I am. There's old me. It's an archive. It's like you just <laughs> saved archive of, of my personality and who I was and what I was dealing with and all my struggles and all my like great things that happen. All that is stuck in the language and, and lives there. Uh, mm -hmm. And the idea of you being able to like do save games of yourself, like that's what opens up with language learning in terms of the personality stuff. And it's super cool. Like you don't, I, there's no other way to do it. Yeah. Do you think that, um, I, I guess, how, how do I, how do I phrase this? The ability to master anything, right? In your case, it was the ability to learn languages after learning languages, or maybe in the process of acquiring one language and maybe you're 60% at this one, maybe you're 90% at the other one, but just getting good at learning languages. Did you notice that other things in your life came easier? Like you became better at mini golf or you just started to like break stuff down and it was a lot easier to learn anything learning languages is learning is 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 the like the thing i got good at was not learning languages the thing i got good at was was figuring out how to get information outside my head into my head and so that influenced everything it also like i think one of the things that it really influenced frankly was therapy um in the sense that what i started seeing was because I was getting so nitpicky about how to build memories in language, 
that it wasn't just, okay, if I just like, okay, here's a recipe, let me go do that recipe. And then I'm going to learn lots of words, but rather it was, okay, if I'm going to be systematic about this, how do I build an imagery component into this thing? How do I build a word association component to this thing? And how do I build emotional components into this thing? How many associations can I, can I light up at the same time that I get exposed to this word? That's how we make, that's how we think. It's like, it's not even just how we memorize. It's how we think. It's how our brains work. And so the more plugged into that you get, the more you see it and you're like, oh, that's why I remember. That's why I get sad when I see this thing is because it like connects to these 10 different memories that were like really shitty back then. Oh, then like it lets you get better at like living. I don't know. I feel like the, the ability of to pick up new skills and know how that works because I'm like, okay, well, I need my hands to do this thing. So I need to associate this motion with this, this thing. When someone says that I need to, when someone says swing in the tennis racket, I need to like do this set of set of steps. Like there's the idea of becoming good at like your brain doing the thing the brain does. That's what I got from the language learning thing. I mean, and it's been really neat. Like I, I, my wife started going to med school and she's like, Hey, I'm trying to deal with like this ridiculous body of information that they're trying to jam my head. I'm like, Oh, well, cool. Let's talk about it. Like, let's, <laughs> let's figure out how to make that more emotional. Let's figure out how to make those interactions more, more spicy. Like, how do you, how do you get your stress level to the right level so that you aren't like oh, so freaked out that you can't retain anything? Like, let's talk about that. And, and that's not language learning anymore. It has nothing to do with language, but it's just skill mastery. Yeah, no, absolutely. So you basically apply the same method of language learning to everything that you want to learn. That is anything, whether it's physical uh, yeah. motor skills or mental. I think some of the motor skill stuff doesn't apply, but like it, it's, it applies more weakly, but any mm. kind of mental skill and usually physical skills will have some mental skill associated with it. Um, absolutely. So I, I think language learning is, is not, it's not special. It's special for only one reason, really, which is that all of the information in language learning has the same format. That's the only thing fancy about language learning. There's like this tiny component about the sound thing, like this, this, you know, Fanny Gape as you gave thing we talked about earlier, that's special yeah. to language learning. You don't encounter that elsewhere, but beyond that, the only thing that's really unique to language learning versus learning, like how to write or like math or whatever, is that every language is composed of a string of sounds that forms into words that forms into sentences. Whereas when you're learning math, like geometry looks very different than algebra. It looks very different than calculus. Like those are whole different mm. categories of information. And so you can't just be like, well, let me come up with a recipe for memorizing sentences and words <laughs> for math. Like you have to come up with 10 recipes or 30 recipes, whereas language learning, you really can come up with like a tiny handful of recipes and just repeat them a 5,000 times for every single language in the, in the whole face of the earth. What's your take on this? When I talked to Benny Lewis, he said, I said, what's the, what's the main thing, man? Like, cut all the BS. Like if you want to learn a language, what, what's your go-to? He's like, just speak, go on italki and speak. And I guess that's what fluent in three months. I never read fluent in three months, but I'm assuming that's kind of what he talks about. Mm -hmm. Uh, what's your take on that? If you, but well, before you tell me what your take on that is, he, I was telling him, well, what if you don't know anything? You're just going to stare at your teacher. Like, what if you don't even know how to say hello? He's like, I don't care. I just, I just talk to them and that's it. I was like, okay, so if you're learning Japanese, you don't know one word of Japanese and you're only going to speak Japanese, like the teacher's going to be confused. He's not going to, he or she's not even going to understand what the hell's going on. He's like, I don't care. I was like, I feel like people would quit. He's like, yeah, that's the fastest way that you, the fastest way to learn is just talk. If you want to talk, talk. Hmm. What's your take on that? He's not wrong at all. Uh, I mean, the, the thing that I'm talking about, about, you know, fight your way through, uh, you know, hard drive, like mm. that's the same thing. It's, it's how do you make the right connections? You can have, like, I, I had my first conversation in German in, in like an immersion program where they were like, we're not going to speak English to you. So I hope you don't want that. Cause we're not gonna. And like, you start that conversation and they're like, hello, ich heiße Gabriel. And you're like, what? <laughs> like, <laughs> ich heiße Gabriel, wie heißt do and you're like, uh, what? And you're like, okay, Gabriel. And you're like, Justin. <laughs> and you're like, okay, ich heiße Gabriel. Da, 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 Justin. And you're like, uh, right. ich heiße Justin. And you're like, good. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so you can have, you can have stupid conversations that eventually lead somewhere, even when you don't know a damn thing. 
the thing that Benny's doing when he's really being insistent about that is that it forces you to live outside of that whole translation realm. And so he's but doing- But don't you have to translate it though? No, Aren't you, you gotta... like on Google images and, or on Google translation and be like, what did they say? And then you're like looking at, oh. No, like you don't have to, you can skip that thing. Mm. It's work and you have to get used to that work. And this is why like Benny's done this a bunch of times. And so he, he knows the routine of, okay, I don't know a damn thing. I need to get them to say stuff to me so that I get it. So I'm just going to speak. He knows what that feels like. Whereas people who are new to it, they don't know what it feels like. And so they're like, screw it. I, I need Google, Google something. Someone, <laughs> someone help right. me. And maybe it's Google. And like, they're going to be the ones to fix it for me. But, mm. um, at the point where you get really used to it and you're like, okay, no, no, no. The thing I need is I need high quality content that has a lot of like imagery associated with, with it and emotions and all this kind of stuff. And you can get there. Um, I, I tend to be really systematic about that. I tend to be like, this is the recipe to do that because I have an engineering background and I like recipes and I like, like yeah. everything fitting in its boxes. And so, uh, I, I, I come up with recipes for it. Benny's recipe of just do it lands in the similar place. He's, mm. he's getting you to, to dump Google translate and work in the language. And that is actually like a pretty, pretty central key. He's, he's on the right track with that thing. Uh, I think there are ways to make it more systematic so it is less scary. And there's ways to make it uh, clearer so that you don't feel lost and don't feel mm. like, well, I don't have any tools. So what are you going to do about it? Like, how are you going to help me? Um, yeah. But the final result is, is similar. I think Benny's thing uh, often will, when you have people who are like really, really extroverted and are just kind of like, oh, I just, I don't have to, like he, Benny gives you permission to drop grammar. He gives you permission to drop all the societal stuff around language mm -hmm. learning and just says, go do it. And for the people who are already kind of inclined to do that and are just waiting for the permission, that works really, really, really well. Uh, for the folks who are like kind of more introverts or more analytical and are like, but, but what do I do? Which are people like me. Um, then, then having a little more structure around it being like, yeah, but, but how, <laughs> like, right, okay, right. I get just to speak, speak in the target language. Don't speak English, oh, but you're like, good, how, Gabe. what do I do? You're good. Just do it. You're like, wait, right. well, no, I need a system. I need like, how, how are we, yeah. we going to, I need, yeah, this has to be a machine. Well, it doesn't matter, bro. Just go do it. Right. It's just no, like I, for someone that's like analytical engineering mindset that you go nuts. Exactly that. Like you, it's, it's nice to have machines and like, but that's okay. Machines are available. You can go find the machines and then like you have the machines. They, they land in the same place and understanding what that final thing looks like, which is just cool. We're just going to talk. Yeah. That's Be an important thing to know. For sure. Besides fluent forever, what do you think would be the second best language learning approach in the world? Mean question. Um, like if you were to stack fluent forever with another either app or program, what would you do besides Italki? I mean, the, like I keep DIYing Fluent Forever and I've been DIYing Fluent Forever since the start of the thing. Like I don't, mm -hmm. the idea of like, you know, use our app, you, that's the one way to learn a language. Like, no, it's not. Like learn how, how learning works and then go do a thing. And if yeah. you want to use something that, that we built, cool, but like, don't, don't be forced to do that. Go, go DIY a thing. Um, in terms of like- What would you ready, stack with it? What would you stack with Fluent Forever if you had to? I know you don't need to. I get it. I, I, I know. I know. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm going to have to stack second to Fluent Forever, like not using our shit, but doing the similar method. Uh, but number three on there, <laughs> I think are, are these, these um, like content first approaches. Uh, I would say Ollie's is one of them. I think there's, um, what's the, like a Jap, uh, like a, all Japanese all the time one. Um, mm -hmm. There are these approaches that are just like, let me just throw you interesting content and get you to connect with it and ideally level it to your level, which is the thing that Ollie's really great at is just being like, you don't know a damn thing about Japanese. Let's give you the easiest story in Japanese. Like he's good at that thing. And there's other folks who are good at that style of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, Ollie's is really focused on reading. I think there's other services that will be more focused on things like, like video stuff like that, which for some people are going to be way more engaging. Um, but what you're looking for <laughs> is you're looking to find ways to engage with content that don't overwhelm you that aren't just, I'm staring at this anime thing and I understood the first word and that was it. Mm -hmm. uh, and so those would be the approaches that I'd, I'd run towards. Uh, I do think that having that live component of like working with the italki kind of folks really has a lot of value if you can get them to stay in your target language and if you can have the diligence to do it yourself. Um, and it's hard to replace that. I don't know like where else you can 
you can't get live people without live people. Like, no, for sure. Absolutely. Uh, so that let's do a list though. Let's do a list. Uh, before we end this thing, let's do a list. Okay. Yep. Let's do the top five Gabriel Weiner things to do when learning a new language. Okay. And the top five things not to do. Don't waste mm-hmm. your time. This will set you back. Uh, for someone that's never even looked into it, doesn't know Fluent Forever, doesn't know Benny Lewis, doesn't know Ollie Richards, doesn't know Rosetta Stone, they, but they want to learn a language. They don't know anything. What would be your, hey, definitely do this and definitely don't do that? Okay. And we want five things and five things or can like one of them yeah. be don't do this, do this instead? That's fine. Okay. Um, so number like one, the starter um, pack, the learning language starter learning pack. Starter pack. Okay, cool. Okay. So <laughs> number one, uh, don't wait to learn pronunciation. Do that in the beginning. Mm. You're not going to remember words until you do it. So just do it. Start there Do ear training. Start there. Um, if you got to like run around on YouTube, whatever, you don't want to use full forever products. That's fine. Go do that. But like do just, just get your ears working in that language. Um, Number one, that was number one. That's okay. just hear. That's just hearing stuff. That is hearing stuff. There is. Yeah. A, there's actually. There's a bunch of research on how to do that best. The most efficient thing is if you're learning something like Spanish, uh, and you can't hear the difference between the D and the T, doma and toma, like they sound pretty mm-hmm. similar. Um, what you need is you need to you need to get quizzed on those two things. I need to be like toma, which is the one I did. Was it the D one or the T one? And then you go, yeah, like, toma. Uh, cool. That yeah. was the T one. And then you're like, great, cool. It was the T one. And we have that that cycle. That's what trains your ears. So you need to have some source of that. If that's from a tutor, if that's from whatever, get that thing. That's that's the ear training that I'm talking about. That was one. Um, number two, uh, don't learn translations. Just don't <laughs> memorize translations. I feel like I've been like y- yammering about this for an hour, but like, don't memorize translations. So don't remember. Don't memorize. How are you? Or can I go here? Don't do that. No, memorize, memorize imagery. If you got to do imagery with fill in the blank sentences, that's, that's okay. You know, like, uh, how blank you Mm. shitty and just have a person who's like, really sad. And then all you see is how blank you having a shitty day, sad person. That is R. That is what R looks like. (laughs) That is how you learn. How are you? Mm. or blank are you whatever like you just do a blank use fill in the blanks to learn abstract words and then use images to learn everything else and just stick images on everything always if there's not an image there you're not learning it right mm. so do images not translations that's that's two um are you ever th- allowed to look up words you can look up words as long as you re-encode them or as is images. that a crutch is that it's, a crutch it's it's, it's, it's fi- i'm fine with crutches like any crutch is fine the issue is that the thing that you repeat, so we'll do number three. Number three is don't like, like you use flashcards. <laughs> don't not use flashcards. <laughs> uh, use, <laughs> use uh, specifically use spaced repetition. Um, have a thing that figures out like there, there are beautiful computer programs out there that will figure out when you're about to forget information and they'll quiz you on it right ahead of time. Mm-hmm. And if you don't use them, you're going to forget stuff. Like it doesn't matter how intense your experience was that first time you had imagery and you had emotions and all that stuff. Like, that's great. That will hold you, hold it for you for a few weeks, but you're trying to hold this for years. So you got to have something remind you about that cool experience with the basura thing that you had with the janitor. Yep. And so encode that stuff in, in, in a flashcard format, really, because that's the easiest way to do it and like get quizzed on stuff. So you remember it like that, that's key. You, you got to have that thing. Um, that, that like it, 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 it five X is learning retention compared to just like mm-hmm. reviewing something once. And you can't, you can't pass over a five X change. Like that's, that's, it's too much time for you to be like, ah, I don't need the five X. Like I can go five times less efficient. Like, no, you can't, like, you don't have time for that. Um, so that's that chunk. Um, the, I guess number four will be a kind of weird niche thing, but it's actually like it doubles your learning speed. So it's important. Um, don't learn in categories. Uh, every time that you sit there, you're like, I'm going to learn all my colors today. And then I'm going to learn all my numbers mm-hmm. tomorrow. And I'm going to learn all my professions the next day. You just took a 50% hit on your ability to retain. And that day that you learned it, that took you twice as long as it would have taken you if you didn't do that category thing. Our brains are crappy at learning categories. They actually, it, it actively screws up your ability to remember anything that you learned on that day forever. You never like 
stop suffering from that penalty when you did that to yourself. Don't do it. Um, learn in associated groups instead. Learn red and apple and delicious, not red, green, yellow. Mm. So that was four. What's our five going to be? Um, <laughs> it was just a small hack. Yeah. The last one would be like a small niche hack that is not super popular. Frequency lists. Let's talk frequency lists. Um, learn, learn high frequency words, not, not like it's really a, a, another part of this category thing, but, um, you, you use the word mother almost 60 times more than you use the word niece. Why are you learning niece? Do you have a niece? Like, is that a person who's like a really key important part of your life? Like, if so, yeah, learn niece. That's now a, like a custom set of words for you. You're like, niece is mm -hmm. one of the things I use all the time. But if you don't have a niece or you don't care about your niece or you don't interact with your niece, like learn mother, learn father, and then be like, I am done with family <laughs> members. It's over. I need nothing else. Let me go learn other important words like laptop or president or democracy. Like these are mm -hmm. words that you're like, oh no, that's an advanced word. Like, no, no, no. Those are words that everyone uses all the time. And they use a thousand times more than pass me the fork or blouse. <laughs> Jesus Christ. People are learning words like blouse. They're like, I need to learn all my clothing blouse. Like, no, no one needs blouse unless you're buying. Like, that's a super important thing to you. Uh, so learn high frequency words first. Every word that you learn later, will, will, you'll learn faster based on the earlier words you learn. Your learn speed increases over time. And so you getting the most value out of those initial hundred words or initial thousand words is going to set you up for you actually getting to the end of this thing rather than you being like, well, there's 50,000 words to learn. I guess I'll start at word number 50,000 ubiquity. And you're like, Jesus Christ, don't, don't do that to yourself. <laughs> can so you just my, Google, my five. can you, can you just look up like most you sure can in any language and then top, just top, print, top then Italian words, out. most frequent, most you use most frequent Spanish, French, whatever words. And you will find a list from Wikipedia and that just will knock be the them out. and just knock them out and like knock them out with like interesting stuff. Like go to it, go to your italki tutor, get an italki tutor. I guess one of mine was just a negative. So I get one more positive one, <laughs> uh, get an <laughs> okay, italki what, tutor what the... and have like interesting interactions about, Hey, I see this word on this list. It says it's like, you know, although can you help me come up with a personal sentence about right. although that like that means something to me. Like I, I, I would have done this job, although I kind of hate it. Like, cause it's, cause it's like, cause I really don't like these things. And you're like, okay, cool. I found this sentence that really means something to me. Now I'm gonna throw that on the flashcards and now I'm not gonna learn a translation of it. Like all that stuff. Uh, you asked about the crutches thing, like that first moment of you being like, Hey, I don't quite understand this sentence. Can I dump it into Google translate? Totally. It's just the second time you see it. No. The mm -hmm. first time, use as many translations as you want. Use all the crutches. Like, I don't care. But the second time you see it and the third time you see it, all those, those re repeats, all those flashcards, if, if those are translations, then the thing you're practicing is translation. It's not the target language. Uh, and so your goal is, how do I make it so the second time I see it, I'm only thinking in the target language? Right. Yeah. And that's huge, too, because yeah. you want to focus on your language, not learning how to be a good translator. Yeah. Uh, what are the red flags? But number one, do not do this. Absolutely. This is a waste of time, but for whatever reason, people think it's helpful. Um, memorizing grammar with no, no context. Don't do that thing. Okay. okay. Uh, just don't do that thing. Um, memorizing rules that you've never actually even seen examples of that you don't already know examples of that's too abstract. You're not going to hold on to it. Don't do it. Mm -hmm. Learn grammar rules after. You have some examples. You're like, he's a, he's a, he's a doctor. She's a, she's a student. I'm, I'm a CEO now. Yeah. Learn the conjugations for, for to be, cause you already mm. have three examples in your head. You can use a few more and fill in your holes. Like that's the greatest time to learn grammar, but don't learn grammar earlier than that. Um, I mean, I feel like we already did a bunch of red flags in terms of the categories thing, uh, yep. in terms of not using like, like skipping over the flashcard thing and being like, oh, I'm sure I'll remember it someday. Like, no, you won't. Um, no, you definitely will <laughs> memorize no, the translations. I, like, yeah, that's, that's fine. People can take, uh, p p p I think a big, be a beginner jumping into this. If they listen to this podcast, they'll, uh, they'll have more than enough to at least within six months, have a conversation with someone in their target language. Yes. You know what I think would be cool 
Hmm. This could be a million million dollar idea, Gabe, for Fluent Forever. I love million dollar ideas. <laughs> virtual reality learning. Oh, I've already been there. I've been researching that for the last year. So, because I was thinking, I never thought about this before today. I was thinking, how could I simulate the jan- the Spanish janitor with basura? Mm-hmm. And I was like, well, if you could get into virtual reality where people are just talking to you in different languages and you're interacting like if you were in China, mm-hmm. right? But it's it's not catered towards a learning system. It's just you're you're in China and mm-hmm. you're observing and people, they don't have that weird... Uh, you know, even if they're not telling you they're getting annoyed, you can, you can feel their energy of they're getting annoyed and they're losing patience, but yep. virtual reality, they're not real people. So they could just keep going. I think that would be a huge one. You can do a lot more even in virtual reality. Virtual reality is um, like, you get this feeling of, oh yeah, yeah. Like, like being in a coffee shop with a Chinese speaker, that's the best way to learn Chinese. No, 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 no. Being, being in virtual reality with a real Chinese speaker where both of you have the ability to do anything of the moment that you're like, I want to talk about my trip. Boom. Here's a plane. Let's get on the plane. We're on the plane. I sat over here in this seat and this in the aisle seat right there. How do I talk about this thing? Cool. Then we eventually, we got to Japan and then like, Oh, well I need to, I need a copy of Tokyo. Load it up. Makes perfect sense. It's amazing. It's the whole thing is images, right? It's the whole, the whole thing is images. It it's would make images sense. in space, which is even more, but be- it's, it's better than images alone. You imagery is the thing that we store. There's two things we store best. We store imagery well, and we store spatial memories really well. If mm. anyone who's listening to this is like, Hey, go back to your childhood home, open the door. What's on the right. Everyone knows the answer to that question. What's on the left. What happens when you walk five, five steps forward? Like, you know, all that shit because yes. spatial memory is completely amazing. Virtual reality is the only way to really take advantage of it for language learning that I'm I've, that I'm aware of. Uh, and you're getting me excited. It's Where do so I sign good. Up? I mean, I've I've you're getting I've me excited. Out with VR. Yeah. Hey, when uh, when when Fluent Forever comes out with a VR, I'm, the, I'm your first member. I will I mean... sign up and I'm <laughs> down to go. Yeah. Um, yep. I just I, I don't know if from like a business standpoint, not from like learning language standpoint. Obviously, that's effective, but from a business, if there's enough users yet, there will be. I mean, VR yeah. is is the future of this thing. Uh, like, there's. There's a lot you can do in terms of like Zoom sessions and things like that, but VR is just mm. too good. I mean, it's ever, too good. Are you ever worried about languages getting wiped out from technology? Like, isn't there like a Google system where you, you can type in or say anything and it and it translates it out, but it's but it's not Google Translate. It's it's a different type of system that Google created. Are you ever worried about a a just a general everyone speaks the same language via technology? So it's kind of pointless to learn a new language. Have you ever thought about that? I, I'm not overly concerned about that because I think when you, the moment you actually speak someone's language, you find that like, there's a completely different connection than you being able to send some information to them that they understand. Yes. Um, learning like, like speaking in translation is, is a thin interaction and it's enough to get some stuff done. Like if you're just like, I just want the damn tacos, like, Hey, Google. How do I say, give me a taco? And they're like, blah, blah, blah. You're like, okay, cool. I got my tacos. But the moment you want to be someone's, <laughs> Google's like, wait, yeah. what? Um, <laughs> where's, the, where's those damn tacos? Probably some good tacos in Chicago. There are good tacos in Chicago, uh, but not as good as in LA. Um, the moment that you want to actually connect with someone, you trying to deal with like a translator in the way, it's it's gone. And like mm. the modern era is an era of us like struggling with connection. We are just like, how the hell can I, can I not feel so damn alone with all this social media shit and all that stuff? Uh, and so the idea of like, well, I know I'll fix it. Google, Google will make it so that I, I, I now like connect with people. Google ain't going to fix that for you. Like, <laughs> uh, and so you're going to need to be able to speak their stuff. If, if what you want is I, I want to feel less alone. I want to go to Japan and feel, feel connected to people. And that's, I think what people, it's a lot of what gets people passionate about a language is that they, they go to Japan and they go to Tokyo and they're like, this place is amazing. And like, this media is amazing. And like, I love the things that these people like, but I feel alone here and I Mm. want more. And that's what drives people to learn Japanese. It's not that they they're trying to order something online and they don't know how to do it. And just, I, I I need to spend a year or two you know, memorizing this language so that I can like order a damn toy. Like, no, like Google will fix that for you. Uh, but it's not going to fix you feeling lonely in Tokyo. Yeah. Well, I think there's multiple different reasons 
why people have the motivation to learn anything, but definitely language, right? Like yeah. some people, yes, if they're in a foreign country, they need to understand how to say or order something, right? But those people, they don't care about learning. They just want to get, yep. it's just efficiency, right? Yeah. Then I think other people want to learn to show off to show that they're smart and, mm -hmm. and, and be like, oh, I speak multiple languages and I'm such a, I'm, I'm a scholar and an intellectual and, and it, it works because people that speak multiple languages, like, especially for like getting girls or getting guys, like that definitely works because it's hot when someone speaks multiple languages. Like that's a sexy trait. Sure. So I think some people learn for that aspect, myself included. And then some people, uh, they learn because they're, you know, they love the culture and they want to, you know, maybe they're not Japanese, but maybe they want to be part of Japanese culture. Like they are a Japanese native. Um, so there's multiple, multiple different motivations. I think the last one is the one that is the most sustainable. Yes. Um, you know, so how do people, when they go to fluent forever, how do they sign up? What is there to be expected? Um, and then, you know, where do people get your book or should people just go right to your app? Um, the, the best place to start, I would say is the app in the sense that the, that, that we have like a two week trial thing. And during that two weeks, really what we did is we took all the best mm -hmm. excerpts of the book and we turned it into like video lessons and stuff like that. And so the final result is like two weeks later, if you really do the thing, like do use it. Cause it's like, you got your free time, like use your free time. <laughs> um, during that time, you, you leave that becoming a better language learner. Like this sense of like, oh, you know, the first time I stumbled through Spanish, I don't know what the hell I'm doing and I'm going to make all these mistakes. Like there's a way to get around that, which is lean on someone else who already made those mistakes. And like, lean on me. I made all those mistakes. Uh, <laughs> and so uh, that that first two week app experience, like regardless of what stuff you use eventually, there's no reason not to do that thing because you're going to leave learning faster than than you started forever. Like right. you never, you never yeah. will slow down as a result of that thing. Um then like, I think there is a question of like, do you want to use some of the stuff that we do? Uh, and like all the stuff that I've been building has all been about like, Hey, I have this method and it's kind of hard to use. <laughs> How do I make it easier to use? Uh, it's been my focus for the last like 12 years, frankly, I, I used to do workshops of the stuff where it's like, here's a 12 hour workshop and here's eight hours of computer skills. Like, Jesus. <laughs> uh, and so the, the whole focus has been, how do I make that smaller and smaller? And so to that end, um, for folks who are kind of like casual learners and are just looking for, I want something like Duolingo, but works a little faster, go grab our app. Like try that thing. It'll teach you pronunciation. It'll do all that ear training stuff that I was talking about earlier. And it'll get you some vocab really quickly and you'll get images and all that stuff. That's good. Um, but the folks that like want to learn, like really get it fast, uh, that that should like, use our coaching stuff. Like we, the last year has been about like, what, how do we make these like really cool italki experiences where you're really like fighting your way through hard drive. And then how do you turn that into flashcards that you remember? How do you mm -hmm. make interesting interpersonal relationship, ha like things happen. And then how do you retain that long-term? And so we built this platform. That's just like that. It's just talk to a native speaker. You're all going to have like cool things about your life. We're not going to sit there being like the subjunctive in Spanish is blah, blah, blah. But like, that's all done. Like if you, if you want that conversation, you can ask for it. But otherwise it's just, Hey, what's your deal? Let's talk about your life. Let's turn that into a bunch of interesting sentences. Let's give you all that content about, you know, is it your book or is it by you? Like, cool. Let's, let's make a thing for that. And then mm -hmm. every evening we send you flashcards about your life and only about your life and no generic content. And then people are learning like nuts. I mean, I, I we have people That's hitting so fluency. much better than italki. It's glorious. I mean, I That's like so much I, better than italki. I'm signing up guys. My, my app. I mean, like, like if you asked me a year ago, like, Hey, how's your app? I, my answer would be like, yeah, it's good. Like it's, it's pretty good. Like, I think we're getting there. Mm -hmm. Like it's pretty good. You asked me about this coaching shit. Like this is fucking great. Like this is everything I've always wanted it to be. So like, yeah, it's, it's like I. It sounds like I talking on steroids. So if someone's yeah. super serious, but they're like, I don't like. I'm not. I've wasted time. I want to learn. I'm already old. I, I don't have much more time to waste. I want to go to different countries and and speak these languages. Get, get the, for the hard thing. for Just the hardcore. You would say coaching is better than app uh, everything. The the the, uh, the app augmented coaching thing. The idea of I want I want coaching, but I want everything that happens to that coaching to show up in my app so I don't forget it. That combo is just glorious. I mean, we have people hitting fluency in Spanish in like five to eight months. It's stupid good. What? It's stupid good. All right, I'm signing up, guys. No Do bullshit. It. Actually, yeah. I did sign. I did send my sister. She's learning Italian um, about 
I think it was like six or seven months ago, I told her fluent forever is the way to go. And uh, so she did sign up. So I did send, I did send Gabe a referral. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. And he he didn't even know it. There you go. (laughs) Now this thing's good. I've been really happy with it. uh, Yeah, I'm definitely going to, I'm definitely going to do that for sure. Um, cool, man. Well, listen, I could talk to you forever. Um, I think you're an awesome dude. And, uh, you know, hopefully if I'm ever in Chicago or Tokyo, I'll hit you up and, yes. uh, we'll, we'll get, we'll get dinner and maybe we'll invite Ollie and, uh, we'll, we'll burn it down. It'll be fun. Oh man. that would be so fun. All right. Um, besides, uh, fluent forever and, and, you know, downloading your app and, and getting the coaching, uh, how do people reach out to you or, or do you not talk to anyone? Uh, I don't talk to anyone in the whole world. I just live in a cave. It's really <laughs> awesome. Uh, no, I mean, just, just if you don't uh, have our website my number, has context stuff. <laughs> uh, I mean, our website has context stuff like, and that's, that's a good way to do it. Also, um, all that coaching stuff involves, uh, anyone who's on the coaching plan, like also does like master classes with me every two weeks or like we bring oh, you really? guests like Ollie. Um, and so there's all, a lot of opportunities to do lots of Q and a and be like, Hey, like I have this really, really specific thing. I'm trying to do this crazy thing. I only want to learn Spanish for, I don't know, hang gliding. How do I learn Spanish just for hang gliding? Like, and wow. then, then we can have those conversations because usually every time someone has a question, it's useful for someone else. And so right, the idea of having Q and A times has like been really, really awesome to see that. No, that's awesome. I think it's uh, the most efficient way to learn. And uh, I'm glad Ali sent you over. Uh, I knew about your stuff before I even met Ali. So I think this is great. Um, yeah, everyone go, go to Gabe's stuff, download Fluent Forever. It's amazing. Uh, get his book. I have his book. It's in the back somewhere. Um, <laughs> but I don't want to get up to show everyone that I'm not wearing pants for the Zoom call. Um, so reach out to Gabe. And as I say, every single time, there's the uh, the show note description below. We'll have all the links, uh, the Instagram, the Fluent Forever website, everything. So you guys don't have to go on a wild goose chase. Everything will be in the show note description below. Gabe, I appreciate your time. And uh, that's it. Any last words before we end this thing? Nah, this was super fun. Thank you. You're awesome, man. All right. From Gabe to Justin, from Justin to Gabe, this is the Justin Caviar Show, and we are out. Bye-bye, y'all.